Route 66, Route 66. We'll drive around the classic cars, pick up chicks and biker bars. It doesn't matter where we are, as long as we're on Route 66, Route 66. Okay, Insane Sam here, and this is the second leg of the second day of your Route 66 party tour. You're really going to like this episode because you're going to see a lot of cool stuff. And this is the episode where I uh, tell you about when I locked myself out of my hotel room naked. But before we get going, let's get you this segment's directions. Because even though there's a lot of Route 66 signs all along the way, they're often confusing. And without a good set of directions, you're going to get lost. And getting from Mitchell, uh, Illinois to St. Louis is particularly tricky, so don't try to wing it. So to get your directions, go to route66mc.com. Go to the right hand column on the home screen and find Get Directions. Put Mitchell in the Leaving From box and Cuba in the Heading To box. Click on Get Directions and turn by turn directions between those two towns are going to pop up. So let's go. It always seems to take forever to get through St. Louis, but I'm going to give you a few options that might make things easier. The first option is just to skip St. Louis altogether. This will save you a couple hours but you're really going to miss a lot of cool stuff like the Chain of Rocks Bridge, Ted Drew's Frozen Custard, if you feel like stopping in William Tecumseh Sherman's Grave, and a bunch of beautiful rides once you get through the St. Louis suburbs. If you want to skip St. Louis, just get on I-270, head towards St. Louis, get off on I-44, and follow it to Gray Summit, and I'll meet you there. If you want to keep on Route 66, stay with me and I'll give you a couple of other options as you go. All right, the 630 foot tall Gateway Arch in St. Louis is the tallest man-made monument in the United States. You can take rides to the top, but that looks pretty confining to me and I'm not getting on there. During the 1950s, Marlboro, which is the suburb of St. Louis, had at least 15 motels. The Coral Court was the gem of them all. It was built in 1941 and was intended to be the finest motel in the St. Louis area. It flourished until it was bypassed in it, uh, by I-44 in 1972. It hung out as a prosperous spot for a while, but by the 1980s it was in disrepair and it became notorious as a no-tell motel. It was torn down in 1995, but today you can still see the original stone gates at 7755 Watson Road. The Coral Court was involved in one of the most notorious kidnapping of the, kidnappings of the 20th century. That story is too long to tell here, but if you go to Route66MC.com, I wrote two blogs called The Coral Court Caper Part 1 and Part 2. It's a wild but grim story, and just to give you a preview, some people kidnapped a kid, and from the time of the kidnapping until the time they were executed was under 60 days. Justice was meted out a little differently than to today. Okay, so one of the Coral Court rooms was preserved, and it's on display in the uh, Museum of Transportation in St. Louis, and it's worthwhile just to go see that. It's really cool. The Duplex Motel, the Chippewa Motel, and the Wayside Motel, all are original Route 66 motels within the walking distance of the Coral Court site, and they're all open today, and if you want to stay, you'll have an authentic Route 66 experience. I haven't stayed in any of them, but I've toured them all and they're clean and well preserved. On this stretch you're going to go by the world famous Ted Drew's frozen custard stand on Chippewa. This is a must stop spot. Ted and his family started selling frozen custard out of a truck in 1939, uh, that's 29 sorry, but by 1935 the business was so popular they built a permanent stand. In 1941 Ted opened a, uh, another stand on Route 66 which is the current Route 66 location. They serve dozens of flavors of concretes, which are frozen custards so thick that when you turn them upside down, they won't spill out of the cup. Forget your diets and enjoy. Crestwood had a biker-themed bar club called Club 277 attached to the Holiday Inn on Watson Road. It had a lot of hot waitresses who would do shooters with the customers, and plenty of bikes showed up. This is where I usually stay when I'm going along Route 66 through St. Louis because I can always go to the bar and not worry about driving. Attention, attention. This is a Brestus's alert. I repeat, a Brestus's alert. This is not a drill. 
This is not a drill. Okay, I know you've been waiting for this story. This is about when I locked myself out of my hotel room naked. A couple of years ago, I was staying at this Holiday Inn, and I was going to meet my friend Heidi, who was driving in from Nashville for a few days of motorcycle riding with me in the Ozarks. Heidi wasn't scheduled to get in until 9, so I headed over to Club 277 for some dinner and a couple of cold ones. I started with a few Miller Lights, then got hungry and ordered some dinner, and settled in with a turkey and soda to listen to the band to wait to, for Heidi to get there. Heidi got in a little over an hour late, but uh, by the time she got there, I was only on my second turkey and soda, so I was pretty sober and in an excellent mood. Heidi ordered a mojito, and while she was on her second one, a turkey showed up for me. Some guy at the bar I didn't know bought it for me, and he came over to chat. Now, I don't know why this guy was buying me a drink and not Heidi. She's 4'11", and has a set of natural 44 Gs. By the way, she also has an MBA and works for one of the biggest real estate companies in the country. The guy had weird hair, less than Richard Nixon, but more than Don Rickles. Well, I drank the turkey, and I reciprocated by buying him a drink. He wanted a Cavassier, if you can believe that. I should have known I was in trouble. Well, closing time crept up, so I ordered one more and asked for my tab. The guy insisted on picking up my entire bill, and over, over my protestations, the bartender let him do it. Then shooters started arriving. He started with a the Jägermeister. Then the bartender bought us all a Starburst. Then there were some rumple mints followed by a straight turkey shooter. After that, we had a Grand Meunier shooter. I don't remember if there are any more shooters, but the bartender gave me a turkey and soda to go, and Heidi and I went up to the room. Well, I woke up in the middle of the night with dry mouth, so I decided I needed a Coke, so I walked to the vending machine by the elevators. Unfortunately, I forgot to put my clothes on, so I didn't have any money. I also didn't have my room key. Now, that was bad enough, but the bigger problem is I forgot my room number. So I went to the room I thought I was in, knocked on the door, turned out to be the wrong room. Fortunately, the guy who answered the door didn't seem too impressed. Anyway, he must not have been gay because he didn't invite me in. The prospect of knocking on more wrong doors and getting arrested as a pervert or being invited in for a reaming wasn't too appealing. The other alternative was calling the front desk, which also wasn't very appealing. Fortunately, the next door I tried was the right room and Heidi let me in. I got in bed and fell asleep immediately. Next morning, I forgot the whole episode happened until I saw my half-finished turkey and soda on the nightstand. There's a moral to this story. Always keep some emergency Coca-Cola in your hotel room. Unfortunately, Club 277 closed down, but there's a good steakhouse there now called the Twisted Tree, so it's still worth staying at that Holiday Inn to go to that restaurant. Well, with that happy ending, we'll end the second leg of your second day exploring Route 66. But before you go to the next video, hit the subscriber button. You'll get notifications so you'll know when I post new videos. Also, leave your comments on this video. I'll read, read them all and do my best to respond. I'm not giving anybody Heidi's phone number or email address. Insane Sam out.